In this video, we're discussing the Sample Causal Analysis Research Paper. If you want to read the research paper in its entirety, please go back to the Sample Research Paper page. Also, this video is just going to provide an overview of what this person does well. If you want a more thorough analysis of this sample research paper, please click the page on Canvas that looks like this for more detailed commentary. So you can use this essay as a model. Of course, all of you are writing different on different topics, right? You've chosen a topic that appeals to you, but you do need to make sure that your topic is causal analysis. What is the cause of something in our culture or in our society? So this person uses MLA format correctly. I've crossed out the name, obviously. The header is on the upper left-hand corner. Uh, they're missing their last name and page number. Hopefully they've included that in the rest of the essay up here. Uh, the title is effective. Notice the title is not in bold or underlined or in gigantic font. The title uses MLA format. And while the title isn't exactly incredibly catchy or funny or doesn't have a whole lot of pizzazz, it gets the job done, right? It's okay if your title uh, is not necessarily witty. Public recordings of police wrongdoing, colon, a growing trend. So that's an effective title because it tells the reader what they can expect. It's specific to, so it tells us what type of essay this is going to be. And it also sets the tone for the rest of the essay. It makes sense to use a serious tone since the topic is pretty serious. I also like that this person begins with a vivid hook, right? You want to hook the reader in. That's why it's called the hook. So this person begins with a vivid description of the Rodney King beating. And this hook does two things. One, it's an anecdote, but it's an anecdote that we all have some knowledge of, right? Even if you weren't alive at the time, you probably have some knowledge of what happened, or maybe you have some knowledge from your parents of what happened. So this shared uh, cultural moment. It's also really vivid and disturbing, which pulls us in. It's gripping, right, as a hook should be. And then I think it also contextualizes the issue of police brutality. It suggests that this is not something that just started happening recently. It puts it in context. Context. This is a good place for me to point out that this essay is from 2017. I think if the person had written this essay in 2020, uh, they would probably have covered um, different things, right, or, or um, evol evolved or adapted their argument a little bit. Let's look at the thesis. While the issues of police brutality can arguably be traced back to the beginning of the police force, it was this first viral video, that's the video of the Rodney King beating, that sparked public outrage on the issue of police brutality and its relation to race, prompting the public to take matters into their own hands and cultivate an awareness for these issues through an ever-growing and valuable tool, a video recording device. So I like the fact that this person transitions really nicely from the hook into the thesis. Now, take matters into their own hands and cultivate an awareness is kind of vague. It almost sounds like a platitude or a cliche that could be made more precise. But this thesis is effective because I can see the trend, I can see the cause, and I can see the so what or the ramifications, right? The increased filming of police encounters have made, has made people more aware and more outraged. It's also really important that your thesis is debatable. That means that your causal analysis has to be something that a reasonable person who studied the issue might say, no, I think it's a little bit different, or I disagree, or I totally disagree with your argument, right? So a reasonable person could say, well, actually, it's not the video recording device uh, that has increased this awareness. Uh, it's actually social media. Now, this writer does talk about social media later on in the essay, too. Or they could say, no, it's not. It's not social media and it's not the video recording device. Uh, it's a, a, a renewed emphasis from the news media um, on this particular issue, right? You could, you could come up with a variety of causes. So your thesis needs to make an argument that a reasonable person could potentially disagree with. That doesn't just mean that you're making a controversial argument for the sake of being controversial, but it means there's no point arguing the cause of something if everyone agrees that that's the cause, right? If you were to write a paper that said something like, smoking can cause lung cancer, well, that's been widely established at this point, so there'd be no point in writing an essay about it. To what extent it causes lung cancer, why people still smoke regardless of the data, that could be more debatable, that could be more interesting, but you wanna make sure your thesis is debatable and persuasive, and of course, that it's causal analysis. 
This person uses a variety of evidence types. So in addition to examples, um, this person also uses um, data, statistics, um, and anecdotes. It seems to me that the writer has thought about the order of examples, which example should go first and which ex example should go last. So it seems to me that um, giving the example of Walter Scott, which really appeals to pathos, it's an example that a lot of us would have heard of already, uh, but it's an example that's really powerful and vivid and tragic. That might be a good way to begin, right, before offering statistics and other uh, more quantitative data. So starting with this singular example, I thought that was pretty effective. I also like how the writer includes transitions between paragraphs that I barely even notice. So you should be doing the hard work of ordering your ideas and ordering your paragraphs and your examples in some sort of way that makes logical sense. Maybe that's emphatic order, saving your best example or most powerful example for last. Maybe that's chronological order or some other ordering technique. Uh, when you use transition phrase, transitional phrases or transitional words, or when your order of ideas just makes sense, I shouldn't even notice transitions, they should just be so seamlessly integrated. The writer cites even paraphrased material. It's important when you get information from another source, if it doesn't come from your own brain, but you put it in your own words, you still have to use a parenthetical citation and you still have to cite the source in your works cited page. This writer uses headers. You don't have to use headers for this essay. In fact, I don't even recommend that you use headers for this essay. I know it might seem like a long essay, but technically it's not a long essay, so it doesn't need headers. If you wanna use headers, that's fine, but please don't use any sneaky tricks like making them gigantic or adding extra spaces to make your page count longer, obviously. Um, in a later paragraph, the author brings in statistics from a reliable research institution. So many of us will have heard of the Pew Research Center, a nonpartisan research center or think tank. That helps appeal to logos and it helps establish the writer's ethos. Some of the assumptions in the paragraphs do need a little bit more backing, some support. Uh, so you've noticed where I've annotated for that go a little bit farther down. Um, so for the essay, I'm asking that you plant a naysayer. This writer includes some naysayer sentences or begins some sentences with words like although and then references the other point of view, but there's not a naysayer paragraph. I recommend, I don't require, but I recommend that you devote an entire paragraph to planting a naysayer, either a naysayer who would disagree with your overall argument or a naysayer who would disagree with one component of your argument, that will give your essay more credibility. So this would have been a good place for the writer to talk about if there are any situations in which live streaming police brutality can be harmful, right? Address that other point of view. This is where you might want to go back and review Toolman and Rogerian models of argument. Later on, the writer includes an imagined scenario. Remember, you wanna use a variety of evidence types. So in addition to statistics, in addition to, addition to quotations from scholars, uh, in addition to anecdotes, including an imagined scenario, as long as it's a reasonable imagined scenario and you explain your logic and you tie it back into the thesis can be really effective. So this imagined scenario in which the person imagines MLK's I have a, a dream speech, if it were given to today, how would people access to it, have access to it? Would it be live streamed? That seemed really relevant um, and it really helped us, uh, really helped the writer prove his point. Also giving examples of speedy mobilization on social media, giving specific examples of when a hashtag has made people um, protest in the streets hours later, right? When people have mobilized really quickly, that would help um, give this paragraph a little bit more specificity and support because there are plenty of examples. Um, let's see here. Uh, when we get to the end, there are a few cliches and platitudes, and it's hard. It's really hard to write an essay without falling into some cliches. These are tired or um, overused phrases or platitudes. These are kind of um, concepts or ideas that have been stated so many times that they just are meaningless. 
Um, so it's important that you go through your essay and look for cliches like take matters into their own hands or at the end of the day, something like that, and you make them more precise. I always like it when I'm reading a student's essay and I think, wait a minute, they need to support that. I need more on this. This assumption needs some backing. And then the very next sentence does exactly that. So this happened to me when I was reading this paragraph. The writer says, this of course has led to the public decline and trust of police officers, which in turn prompts skeptical citizen citizens to use their cell phone features to showcase the truth. So I was thinking, well, wait a minute, we need some data. We need a poll or we need a survey about Americans' reaction to police brutality, or we need some uh, proof that support of police officers is eroding, right? I don't know that that's necessarily true unless I have some sort of data. This writer anticipates that and uh, gives us a source. According to Gallup, confidence in police is currently the lowest it has been in 22 years in America. So there are some statistics here. They could use more analysis and more context. You can go back and look at my lecture about evidence types, uh, where I talk about how uh, some strategies for interpreting um, statistics and data and percentages. But this person does a good job of anticipating any objection that I might raised to the argument and bringing in some evidence. The final thing I want to say before I move on to the works cited page is that the conclusion does summarize the main ideas of the essay, but it goes beyond summary. In college level essays, we're not just rehashing everything we've just said, we're echoing our thesis in a sentence or two. In a research paper, that part where you rephrase your thesis and remind the reader of your argument, that can be a little bit longer, right? Keep it in proportion to the length of the essay. But you also want to end with memorable closing words, right? You can connect your topic to a larger social, political, intellectual, cultural, or economic issue, right? Spice. Uh, you can make a prediction or a recommendation. You can tie it back into your anecdote from your hook. Uh, you could bring in a scholar. You could end with a quote that's really powerful or really resonates with the reader for some reason. So I like how this person um, looks to the future and talks about how this trend will continue. The annotated bibliography at the end, or the work cited, uh, is a little bit different than ours is going to be. Remember that you submitted an annotated bibliography. Uh, this person has an annotated bibliography, but they've called it a work cited page. So you've already completed your annotated bibliography. All you have to do for your works cited page is take out the paragraphs that you've written under each entry. And then, of course, make sure you update it. If there's a source that you didn't end up using, remove it. Um, and if there are additional sources that you added, obviously make sure you add those in as well. Make sure you use MLA format, use the hanging indent, use alphabetical order. And since you will be citing several works, you have to have six sources, your works cited will have an S, right? Because you have multiple works that you're citing. I hope that helps. Again, if you want more details about uh, what I liked about the sample paper and also what this person could improve, please make sure you take a look at the sample research paper page and read the research paper yourself.